I'm Emily Davis and I am the Associate Leader of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today for a little conversation um, with Detlev Glanet. I'm very curious about how the process of writing this went with Midori seeing as it was changed and um, the dates had to be altered so many times. So. How did you both navigate the writing process? Well, the writing process itself was not infected by Corona, absolutely. Um, Midori called me and uh, asked me for a violin concerto. And <laughs> that was very nice because I know her since long time, not personally, but I know her. I was a big coming out when she was 12, was in a Tanglewood concerto uh, conducted by Leonard Bernstein when uh, some of her violin chords splash, smashed <laughs> and she had to change three times the violin. And I was in the audience. <laughs> so uh, we were laughing a lot about that story. Uh, so I, I, I followed. Three times a yes, moment. Yes, that, that oh was her big sensation. And, and she did a wonderful uh, show there. And she changed the violin with the concert master two times in, in about two seconds or so. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sensational quality. And, well, so we laughed a lot about that story and we talked about this violin concerto plan. And, of course, it was 1900, uh, 2019, the Beethoven year was close. And she asked me if I would write something in connection with Beethoven. And I said no, <laughs> clearly. And that, But this idea was going around. You know, I'm not a big friend of... Uh, so-called biopics in composition and but i i saw in a book this famous letter again to the immortal beloved and it interested me in a very curious way because um i discovered that beethoven was setting words like notes he, he used them in the same manner in, in the same dramaturgic sense and so developed the plan to write a violin concerto about this three-part letter. Wow. So it's almost like a secret code almost within... Some of, some of, but the title is, uh, tells the people. Wonderful. And how did you both communicate over the direction in which the music would go for the concerto? We talked a lot. We met in Berlin. She managed to, to arrange these meetings and it was very nice. My fantasy in the beginning was going in very different directions. And uh, But after a certain point, I... I, I discovered that I could manage it. And this is the point where the composer must be alone. <laughs> so no com no uh, contacts in this phase. But later on, we managed via internet again meetings also between the lockdowns to meet. And uh, we played it through last year, 12 months ago. We changed things and we worked a lot on the cadenzas, what I like always to leave free to the soloists. To develop this together with them. Very excited to hear it. And um, it, you have written one other violin concerto. Yes, many years ago, and um, this was 1994, if I remember well. And this is a completely another piece, a completely another world. The funny thing is, it's based also on text. It is the Sonnets to Orpheus by Rilke. And this is the only connection between it, but the musical world is completely different. Wow, I mean, there's quite a lot of time between writing two violin concertos. Yes, um, that is what's also a, 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 a very interesting point to try it again from a completely another point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm just curious because you mentioned now that two of these pieces have been driven in a way by, by text. And I understand that you have written a lot for opera and that you have been inspired um, for many years by opera. And I just wonder if your approach mm -hmm. to writing for an instrumental concerto to that of something which will be on the stage, if there's any connection or is it completely different for you? Well, before thinking about opera or concert music, I discovered that my musical fantasy always comes from optical imaginations. And words are producing also optical things. So I, I, I can see with my ears and I listen with my eyes. So <laughs> it's working. And maybe this, this is an explanation that I'm so close to, to opera music. And if I, for example, writing a solo concerto, the soloist is like a, a person. 
it is it's like an individual person. It comes to the scene or an entrance of a so, any solo instrument in the orchestra. And um, so the using of text in opera is quite another thing than using a text in concert pieces, of course, because in opera you have a very real and very direct relationship to the text and it tells the audience something. The text in the hidden text in the concert pieces um, is uh, something what is more interesting for me and less interesting for the audience. It gives me a basement to develop certain fantasies. Yes, I love the idea of um, listening with your eyes as well. I, I feel that connects. <laughs> oh, oh, <of> <laughs> exactly. But I, I find when I'm teaching, especially young students, and for the first time they're being introduced to Mozart concertos and things like this, um, the impact of of relating character and presence on stage to how the voice within nothing, something that doesn't have text it makes such a world of difference in their understanding of this kind of thing. I, I think Mozart was very close to this too, because also he was a very opera craftsman, and and he, he loved opera overall. And also, when when his uh, soloists, violin or pianoforte or whatever, uh, be starting something, it, it's like an sometimes like an aria or a recitative or something else. So a person appears, and we see a character, <laughs> and this is. This is fantastic, yeah. Absolutely. I don't want our conversation to be completely infected by corona, but I do have to ask because I think it's something that's really relevant to all of us now as we find a way forward and we look at the, you know, how the world has changed and how the arts have been hugely impacted by the last two years. And how do you see the role of the arts changing or not changing? Or how do you see the way forward as musicians? Yeah, this is a very complicated question, and I was thinking about it a long time. <laughs> and, well, I, I'm not a prophet. I cannot say what will happen in future. But I think this confrontation with a, a completely unexpected situation and a lot of death um, is doing something with us, with us as artists and with us as society. And... Uh, there are several effects. Some, something will change. Not necessarily my kind of writing music, but maybe my relationship to society or to audience or whatever, or the relationship from the audience to, to um, orchestral music. I don't know. But uh, when I look to, in the circle of my friends, I can see they are extremely tired to following concerts on streaming. <laughs> or on the internet or on the uh, on the television or whatever and you, you know maybe corona brought also out something very positive that the live concerto is the real thing and everything every uh, all the other things are lie <laughs> but the, the live concerto is something uh, very overwhelming and very true and i think uh many people felt that because of its absence Yes, absolutely. I think in many ways it's been incredible for so many people to have greater access to concerts that have been streamed. And, mm. you know, living in places like in Scotland, we have many islands where people can't actually access the concerts that are happening mm. in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And for this reason, I think it's been incredible for us to be able to contact our audiences in a more specific way. But for yeah. me, I have so truly missed the art of making mistakes <laughs> and <laughs> being able to perform and have things yeah. go wrong and that being okay, the essence of something yeah, that's... For, for me, the essence is that real people in the same room with me are making music. Yes. And this is, this is so overwhelming strong. Um, even on the small islands, you know, make a string trio or something yes. else, or two people, <laughs> you know, this is all arrange orchestral stuff for a small orchestra. It is always better than anything artificial. And um, like the, the, the famous composer Wolfgang Riem once said, you know, the recording is the documentation of the event, but it's not yeah. the event itself. Yeah. <laughs> I like that so, very much. Yeah. So perhaps what we have all realized, I know I certainly have, is that um, the arts is something which can really, really connect us and it brings us together. And that is what I've missed so, so Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a social event, yeah. especially this very old fashioned European social event. 
reflection yes. about ourselves. Yeah. Yes. And I have one more thing I just want to ask you, and I'm sure people would love to know, have you mm -hmm. visited Scotland before? Oh, yes. <laughs> many, <laughs> many times. Many times. And I'm proud to say that Scotland was uh, the f my, had, uh, was doing my first outside Germany concert ever in oh, the wow. early 90 years. Yes in Glasgow oh, <laughs> and that was the first time ever that my music was played outside Germany oh, and there, there, there were many many events in Scotland after this more than London I have to say <laughs> <laughs> London did a lot <laughs> so my relationship to Scotland is very very good and positive and I'm happy to come back Oh, so how wonderful that we get to renew it again after a period of quiet. Uh, and I'm, I would love to have a good whiskey with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that can be arranged. <laughs> Plenty of places that you can go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think um, I think that's everything for now. And we really look forward to... Thank you, Emily. Yeah, great. Bye bye.